Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is James Sunning from Exeter College um, and I'm going to be talking about, and, and randomly walking in front of the projector, um, I'm going to be talking about my project which was basically uh, to understand um, what experience learners on vocational, medium performing arts based courses have of being in the zone, of experiencing flow psychology and uh, I'm going to fly completely against the recommendations that were sent to me about how I should do this presentation. I'm not going to tell you my findings first. I'm going to tell you about a bit about flow because I appreciate not everybody may know what it is. Um, to do that, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of personal biography. So, I've uh, kind of subtitled, this isn't my question incidentally, uh, I've subtitled the Chasing Effortless Excellence uh, from Choir Boy to Midlands Rock God to NQT. Uh, and by doing so, I'm going to weave that in to the focus for my actual question and the problems that, that, that inspired me. Uh, but let's kind of put it like this. So uh, this, this is, imagine this is me uh, in sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I had a tremendous experience of flow when I was very fortunate to sing in a choir in St Paul's Cathedral, um, purely by circumstance and a very, very kind of forward-thinking choir master. Um, and there was 2,000 choristers in St Paul's Cathedral singing Handel's Messiah. And it was an electrifying experience where, an almost out-of-body experience, which is very common to what flow in my experiences, complete loss of self, complete uh, immersion in the ecstasy and the joy of the moment. Uh, and it stayed with me. But I kind of drifted away from music, and I drifted back into music. And by sometime in the early 90s, uh, you will find me um, propping up a bar somewhere in the Midlands. Uh, looking, that's me with hair. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, and <laughs> but sadly, not very long lived. And uh, I, I played in lots of bands, got into the music business. I wasn't in neither Blur nor Primal Screen, but I just shot the same ball to them. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And again, in that experience of being a practical music maker and having these really intense, I think, what psychologists call peak experiences of being kind of really plugged into the cosmos, plugged into what you're doing, and losing all kind of sense of inhibition and. Uh, you know, self-consciousness, and also significantly for, for us as educators, high performance. So when people talk about flow, it quite often comes up when they're talking about sportsmen as well. It's one of these things we tend to associate. People do really well. It's this kind of effortless joy of succeeding with almost without really feeling like you're trying. So, which brings me uh, to my questions, because I felt I'm going to have to get rid of that picture because I can't bear to look at it. It's just too... Too distressing. No, I'm stuck with it. I'm stuck with me. Um, what I felt was, I've had all these experiences, and it's, essentially it's brought me to where I am. Uh, I had a similar experience, funnily enough, when I interviewed for my first NQT job in a school in London. Uh, I, I felt as I could see the line, and everything was just right, and it, everything flowed, and I didn't have to think, and the three hours of interview was over in a blink of an eye, and I got the job. And so throughout my career, there's been all these really kind of key moments, and they're not the only moments. I should say, but they're key ones. And my feeling was that we've got a problem in vocational learning, and it's twofold. Problem number one is that, um, in my experiences as tutor over the last five years, I I'm swamped, literally swamped, with students with mental health problems, uh, stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia, drug problems, all these related things. And I kind of, I tend to sort of call these guys as being um, kind of uh, casualties of excellence. You know, casualties of uh, target-driven, etc. Et you know, there's a million, a million things we can blame, and we're not here to do that today. But so, um, and I felt, well, this is a significant problem. I can't even teach some of these people because we can't get off the first spot because they're not ready to be people yet. At the same time, there's considerable impact in terms of uh, funding cuts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for CAMs and lots of youth services that support those learners. So we've got that problem. Problem number two is my thinking as well, you know, I've taught vocational music, B-Tech music and music technology for five years. How many of my students are feeling like I felt at St Paul's or on stage at the Princess Charlotte in, in Leicester in those wonderful moments where the wiring of my thinking and the possibilities that I imagine for myself as a person become hardwired? And I'm thinking, well, shouldn't really, vocational learning, I've got quite a lot of latitude at the moment, might change, um, that I can push my learners towards these experiences. I don't mean like give them to them, or there's a trick that I can pull, or maybe there are, but let me see if I can push them forward. So what I was really interested in was this. Can it help teachers and learners? Can understanding flow psychology help teachers and learners? Um, 
Can we create the autotelic or autonomous learner? Uh, and to use a sort of slightly uh, rarefied little phrase there, autotelic is what uh, Mikhail Tixenbihai, who's one of the leading flow psychology theorist, uh, describes as doing something for the love of doing it. So the autotelic learner, or the autotelic experiences, you're just doing it and you're loving it and you're doing it. And a great example would be kind of rock climbing or swimming in the ocean where every stroke just feels a joy. And you're not thinking about where you're going, you're just thinking about the moment of the doing, what you're doing, and you're loving it. Um, it also struck me that, well, um, the students can tell us about how we could kind of cultivate excellence within the context of linear A level as well as BTEC. Okay, so it really struck me that if I can find out what experiences the students are having, maybe this can teach us something about flow and how it works. So I'm just going to zip ahead for a second and show you my research question down here. Up here. <laughs> how do learners themselves characterise their experiences of flow and how can they form new practices in teaching and learning? So I asked them, I said, do you ever experience flow at college? You know, when? In what context? How do you feel? So I obviously, you know, and I, I began by initially sort of almost vetting the cross-section of learners for uh, what I suppose we call genuine flow-like experiences um, across a, quite a broad sample using surveys. Um, we went a little bit further, I think we're going to scroll actually to see the methodology. Okay. Um, I actually began by doing a little bit what I'm doing now, sort of focus groups and awareness sessions so people become conscious of what flow actually is. Uh, they tell us about their experiences and then what I did was I kind of drilled down a bit further with some of the, what I would call higher responders. So people that had a very strong relationship with flow, that had a very clear connection with what I was talking about. Uh, and I did interviews with those. And then we did the feedback and hopefully we'll go on to improve practice next year because it showed up some quite interesting things. Um, just to sort of help out a little bit, and I appreciate I've got kind of limited time, um, just to describe, I was going to show a few videos because internet things has been a little bit, um, uh, a bit patchy. Um, what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about how flow works, okay, and what the conditions are. Okay, so um, for flow to work, and it's very much like Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, and those of you that remember your, your PGCE learning theories thing, uh, essentially it kind of goes like this. If you've got our kind of skill axis from low to high here, and we've got our challenge axis from uh, low to high here, essentially what happens is this. if you set students' tasks and put them in situations where they are working at the limits of their ability at a challenge that pushes them to that limit, and also that they're working on something that is meaningful to them, that there's a kind of, there's a personal investment in it. It doesn't necessarily work if you're just sort of talking about um, I don't know, stacking skiffs or something. It could do, I'm not saying it could do. Uh, and what we find is that that kind of meeting that axis, we get these kind of flow experiences where students describe uh, loss of um, complete engagement. I mean, this, in terms of being educators here, complete engagement is what this is about. It's to, to the exclusion of all else even to the exclusion of um, you know, eating, uh, remembering what they're supposed to be doing, self-consciousness, not these things which kind of quite often plague our learners. Um, it's really significant too, because if we kind of get this wrong and we've got uh, low skill or high skill, low challenge, we get apathy, we get relaxation, we get boredom. Or if we get it wrong, we go too high challenge, not enough skill, and we get into arousal and anxiety. So what I was really interested in is this kind of flow sweet spot where does this happen and what do the learners tell us about it? So very kind of quickly, if I can, sorry, not getting on this trackpad at all. There we go. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that the students said. They wanted longer sessions that reflected industry routines. They wanted creative timetable to allow project work. They were most experiencing flow when they were working on a long-term project um, with a clear and realisable outcome. That on the way they were able to build um, kind of trust, build confidence within the college, um, and then put it into real life in the outside world. Uh, a student gave me a, a fantastic little comment about it. He said, oh, yeah, um, when we did the gig, it's like it's real life. And then the music plays itself through me. You know, it's a very classic sort of thing to talk about those kind of experiences. Like, I'm not even aware I'm playing the music, it's just coming out of me. Um, they liked industry practitioners, they liked industry focus stuff, so there's an obvious thread there. Um, they liked smaller class sizes at level three. Um, 
that's how you feel about that. Schemes of work that follow tap out model, which I shall talk about in just a second. Um, and also, the ones that were most experiencing were the ones that were doing it because they love it. It was the BTEC students that were there because they had a vested interest in being there. They also told us some things, as well as kind of broader things about curriculum design, they were saying things that they love teachers who live for the question. Teachers that show that kind of passion for each moment and they just can't wait to answer your questions. They also love, um, I'm sure it's here, but somewhere, a really important ones, they love digression. They don't mind when you digress because it showed, what they told me was it shows you that you're listening. And they were saying that their most flowy, their most engaged, their most uh, vivid experiences of getting in the zone in a lesson, in a classroom, and bear in mind that only 50% of the respondents ever experience flow in the classroom. Those that do, do so when you're giving them lessons which are joined up with a clear, clear sense of beginning and an arc, which is kind of lots of joined up elements, and, there's, and you're actually in flow yourself. I think learners can recognise this and they like to see it. So it struck me there's real kind of uh, further study here as well, for like, well, let's look at teachers and our flow. What gets us into that, that zone, if you like? Three minutes, thank you. Um, so, where should we go? Um, build confidence in college, college for challenge outside college. There's, there's definitely what appeared to be a step-like process to a real kind of industry-based flow experience that, that, for me, ticked all the psychology boxes, but also ticked my personal experience boxes of, wow, that's an experience that's going to change somebody's life. And it tended to be build trust and um, confidence in college, Get them to become a bit more autonomous and all to tell it, so work towards the things that they love, get them to research the things that they love, and then put those things in action in the world with something that shows them something real. This is a really great one. They, one of the most common things they said was leave us alone. If you want us to experience flow, then leave us alone sometimes. So just let us get on with the thing that we're doing. And that, that chimes with Susan Cain's work about introspective learners, uh, all kinds of things, as well as digital and human distractions that we're all kind of currently working with. Just leave them alone sometimes. And the last thing I'm going to say before I um, time out, if I can find it, is uh, if it helps, take away this idea. Oh, I can just get to it. I'm sorry, I'm really having a nightmare with this track. Now. There, good. So, tap out. It goes like that. Start with building trust, then think about building the autotelic learner, not just the autonomous learner. Somebody that's learning because they're loving it, and because they can see that you love it. Then they prepare, which they can do individually, and then they hit the outside world. And the tap out phrase, I'm, I'm trademarking, <laughs> comes from doing a canoe course. I, I, I tend to capsize a lot. And when you capsize, you have to bang the bottom of the boat to show that you capsized. And I kind of like that, because integral to all of this, was what was coming out from some students were saying is we want to be able to work in an environment where we don't feel crippled by fear of failure. And I, and I think in terms of a vision of kind of excellent, autotelic, autonomous learning for vocational education, we need to put failure at the centre of that experience. But like good failure, supporting, celebrating failures so they don't care. And we can build that, and we're not building fake trust, we're building a real trust based on, yeah, fine, we're doing it, because I'm an industry practitioner, you're going to be, you make mistakes, let's see what happens. Great, you made a mistake. And that builds from there, you move through the autonomy and the autotelic stuff. Hopefully, if you've interviewed well, and you've taken time with your learners in that first few months, they probably are on their way to autotelic anyway. They're probably coming onto your courses autotelic. So the third part of that triangle of skill, challenge, and meaning is hopefully done for you. And now I have to stop as we hit the outside world. But that was it. I, I am actually stopping. Thank, so thank you very much. Um, so yeah, questions. Any so yeah. Questions for Jim? Just bludgeoned, bludgeoned you to death with a monologue. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to use it. Can I use your tube? No. <laughs> No, sorry. <laughs> my guitar and my equipment. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. Does flow come more in some subject areas than others? Did you? I mean, you said you found it with the, the four and a half, vocational. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. You found it in other subjects. Like, can you manage it in maths, maybe? <laughs> yeah, no. This is 
this is, is definitely um, an interesting thing. Um, what I found, bear, bear around, I looked at MPA, but I did look at media, I looked at music performance, and I looked at music technology. So they're quite broadly different in a way. Um, the, the thing that was the defining factor in terms of the most amount of flow, you know, if you want to weigh it like that, was actually, it was the full-timers. The ones that were on full-time extended diploma style courses to the exclusion of others were very flowy. Which kind of makes sense because it was like they, they'd chosen this above all other things. Um, in terms of in certain contexts, clearly students were saying there are some things I'm, I'm never going to get it. I'd never get it in this situation. And as I said, you know, 50% of learners never ever experience it in the classroom, ever. Um, so I think there are more challenges than others. The way I'm sort of flipping it, because I'm sort of doing this in staff development, is actually saying to some teachers that are asking me this question is perhaps the key for it unlocking more flow potential in your lessons is finding where you flow, actually. So did you find that teachers who experienced flow, did you find that they were more likely to have students who experienced flow, or were you not looking at that? Um, only anecdotally. Right. Uh, and and it would be wrong for me to say too much, because that wasn't the focus of my research. Right. Uh, it may be, i like to do this again, because mm. uh, there, there are a lot of kind of interesting questions about it, but, um, but possibly, possibly. I think there's a danger too, though, uh, from some of the stuff that if actually, if you have a teacher that is too, I suppose, like, oh, I've, you know, if you've got a teacher that's monologuing and waving his arms around, like, I've been doing it for too much, that doesn't really make a lot of space, you know. Uh, and as I said, again, a, a really clear, clear signal we got from many, many learners was when I'm left alone. Seriously. You know, it doesn't mean don't do all the other stuff, but just leave me alone a bit. And don't use PowerPoint, and don't get me doing peer learning because we hate it. Uh, peer learning. Oh, peer learning. Uh, not peer learning, peer assessment. Can't stand it. Yes. PowerPoint, peer assessment were the least flowy activities of all the activities. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying experiencing flow needs to be the rubric for all education experiences. I'm not saying that. But, but it was interesting. So, yeah, but, uh, I think you can. I think for A level as well, um, sorry to go on, but I think some of the stuff they were saying about what we like is joined up lessons with a clear sense of kind of arc and uh, linking components was, we, I think you could apply that to any subject, vocational or any level. Any more questions? Okay, thank you.